Dr. David Ho, it's good to be with you, and thanks for joining the show. Uh, it's, it's my real pleasure. Good to see you again. How big of a problem was it not to have testing? It's huge. Without the tests, basically, the healthcare system is operating blind, um, not knowing the magnitude of the uh, epidemic, and it's, it's inexcusable. Uh, we watched China struggle for a good six weeks, uh, never realizing, fully realizing that this is going to hit us next. And uh, we're playing catch up. And uh, although that it's picking up now, uh, our hospital here in New York could uh, now uh, run a thousand samples a day. Uh, a few days ago, it was only 50. And that's but what type of tests are those? And should we be having antibody tests, not these tests that take overnight to get a result? Yes, we need all sorts of tests. So the tests that folks are getting now are called PCR tests, and that's done on swabs from the nose or the mouth. And we're looking for the viral RNA. And, and that's very useful, and that's what's been applied. But traditionally, for fighting infectious diseases, we also get antibody tests, and the antibody tests will tell you whether a person has been exposed to the virus and the body has mounted an immune response. And that's extremely useful, and as particularly for surveying a population. Uh, and, and that's what we're rushing to do, in fact, to see if we could get such tests out to huge numbers and truly understand the penetrance of this virus into the community. Why don't we have an antibody or antigen test yet out there? It's an aspect that's uh, inexcusable. Uh, the tests are available in China, in Korea, in Europe, uh, and we're just in the process of rolling them out, and the manufacturers are all from abroad. And so we're trying to uh, get this out as quickly as we can uh, this coming week. So when will those tests be out where I can just go to a drugstore and say, give me a strip or go to a doctor and have it done in half an hour? Well, we're pushing the FDA to see if they would relax their rules so uh, such uh, useful tests could be applied to a much larger population. But you say you're pushing the FDA. Why is the FDA slowing this down? Well, it, you know, obviously they're trying to do their job. They want to make sure the tests are not going to give false results and, and that would lead to mismanagement and, and, and poor control of the epidemic. So they are trying to do their job. But on the other hand, the delay is also uh, causing significant harm because we're, we're largely blind uh, to what's going on out there in the community. Do you have at Columbia Medical School, where your lab is, do you have antibody tests that you could be doing? Yes. Uh, so we have access to uh, rapid point of care diagnostic tests from several sources in, in China, in Korea, and, and other places. And uh, we, we are waiting for the go ahead. Um, and, and now it, we're just running. Uh, on a small scale in the laboratory uh, to do what the FDA considers uh, validation. And you say you're waiting for the go ahead. Let me press you once again. Do you think the FDA and other authorities should give you that go ahead now, today? You know, we, we push every button we can. Uh, our connections have taken us all the way to the, to the White House to see if we could uh, relax the rules and, and proceed. It's pretty clear that the attitude is is we'll let you do it as soon as possible and and so it's coming along uh it's quite different from a week ago but uh, uh, we still don't have the final go ahead yet are there any things holding up the manufacture of these tests like a pharmaceutical company is willing to just turn these out once they're available um i know the numbers from a one particular source uh, and, and I was told that they have the capacity to crank out a million tests a day. Wow. What did you think when Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, 
the Chinese billionaire, Jack Ma, started donating 500,000 tests to the United States. Uh, my first reaction is uh, how embarrassing for the U.S., for us, to be in this situation. We are a rich nation with a proud history, and uh, we pride ourselves as having the best healthcare system. And now uh, we are short of tests and we're short of masks. We're short of protective equipment uh, for, for our healthcare workers. Um, what a tragedy. Uh, we should not have been in this position. We should have been well prepared. And this is no doubt a failure in leadership and preparedness. And that failure in leadership was at the CDC and at the uh, Washington DC administration level? I think I would have to put this at the top of our government. On the other hand, at the local level, I have admired various institutions, universities, uh, schools, public schools, uh, businesses, and other institutions struggle and fight this epidemic in a most proactive way and 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 i'm i'm really uh, uh grateful and and impressed let's move for a moment from testing to treatment when i was at time magazine as i hope you'll remember we made you man of the year for having come up with a combination treatments for hiv aids what do you think are the most promising treatments for people who already have the disease that are going to be coming along for the coronavirus and COVID-19? Well, how can I forget what Time Magazine did <laughs> in 1996? Uh, but in, in terms of your question, um, in the short term, we have only drugs that are currently available uh, that perhaps could be repurposed to treat this coronavirus. And uh, so we have one in hand, for example, it's called remdesivir. And it was initially uh, developed to treat Ebola. And it's, it's now re being repurposed, particularly in China, to conduct clinical trials to see if it has any efficacy against this virus. The results are not out yet, but at least based on animal studies, that drug shows some promise. Um, there are do, you have, other, do you have any hint of how well, how well it's working in China? Uh, we don't at the moment because it's a blinded study uh, with placebo control, uh, and they're enrolling hundreds and hundreds of patients into that study. Uh, but we, we don't have any readout at this point. Uh, do you there think is we could be manufacturing more of that drug and getting it out to hospitals? Some of it is available on a compassionate basis. Uh, for example, the, the first patient we have here at Columbia, uh, we were able to get it uh, in, within 48 hours. Uh, so you're the, treating patients at Columbia with this, so you think it might help? Well, we would only use it in severe cases and, and hoping that it would help, but we, we certainly don't know at this point whether it helps or not. What did we learn from SARS that we should be applying now? We learned that, that SARS could, could spread very quickly as we're witnessing now for this virus. Uh, on the other hand, we also learned from SARS that if you apply the, the uh, infection control measures that are now widespread, you could really flatten the curve and bring the epidemic down. And in fact, in SARS, you could wipe it out. But you know, given the magnitude of the current uh, pandemic. I'm not sure that we could wipe this one out, but we could at least try to control it following the same measures. I think there is a lesson that, that we, we miss from SARS. SARS told us that a, a coronavirus could jump species uh, into humans and cause an, a, a new outbreak. And we, we kind of dropped after SARS went away, we just dropped it and did not pursue uh, research on coronaviruses very much. And if we had done so, we'd be much better prepared today to cope with the current epidemic. So we should not make that mistake again 
I think even if we are able to manage uh, to to wipe out this epidemic, we must persist with our research effort. Do you think that China is now over the hump, and do you think people are developing immunity to it, so it won't roar back in China? China is not over the hump. China has done a amazingly impressive job of bringing the epidemic under control. It flattened the curve. Now in a country of 1.2 billion, they have around 20 cases a day compared to thousands and thousands elsewhere. Um, and, and that's pretty impressive. But now China uh, still has some segment of its population carrying the virus, shedding the virus, not totally recovered. And also it's now surrounded by quote, sick neighbors. And if it should relax the draconian measures, uh, surely the virus will reemerge. And so the question is, what could China do to mitigate the spread of this virus uh, in a sustainable way? What they have done is, is impressive. It's, it's outstanding. However, uh, what, what's its next move? And I, I think we're all waiting to see that. Do you think there could be new waves of this virus in China and new waves in the United States if and when the United States gets it under control? Yes, I, I think there will be new waves hitting China. And, and if we manage to flatten the curve, uh, we need to figure out a, a effective but sustainable strategy uh, to, to mitigate further spread. Uh, we could flatten it, but but if we are applying practices that are not sustainable, uh, we will simply delay the reoccurrence uh, of the virus uh, spreading in our population. What would be a sustainable strategy to keep it from recurring? I think that's a question that society as a whole uh, needs to answer. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, schools have to reopen. Uh, businesses as well, and various uh, form of uh, sports, travel, live entertainment, all of those things must come back for us to have some semblance of normalcy. And, and so we, we as a society would need to make those decisions um, while trying to uh, keep the spread of this virus to a minimum. Are you worried about coronavirus hitting countries like India and other large countries that don't have great public health systems? And will that keep this uh, plague going? Yes, I'm extremely worried. Uh, what we're seeing now is the first wave in China coming to a low level, and then the second wave hitting Korea, uh, Italy, Iran, uh, and then third way hitting the rest of Western Europe and, and U.S. And then U.S., we have in, in initial waves on the coast. But now, in, in the coming days, another big wave hitting middle America. And this is going to continue to spread across the globe. And at this point, India, uh, South America, uh, Africa are relatively spared but they should, they're not immune to this. Uh, and those waves will simply hit them uh, days or weeks later. And uh, given the density of, uh, of human population in, in India, that's a huge concern. And as you mentioned, the healthcare system in some of these places are not ideal for combating uh, epidemic of this sort. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what's coming up there, but I, I am very concerned. Looking back, does this fight have any comparison to your fight against HIV AIDS? Well, there, there are certainly some similarities and some differences. You know, we're looking at an acute disease that's gone viral, um, and and HIV is a chronic disease. It progresses very, very slowly in an infected person. This one is just the opposite. Uh, 
but the the striking similarity is is by the time we detect the first case of HIV infection in 1981, uh, the virus had already ex uh, spread extensively throughout the U.S. and and throughout the world, uh, largely at that time in uh, uh, homosexual male population. Uh, so we the initial cases were just the tip of an iceberg. And now, just thinking back, it was only about two weeks ago we saw the first case uh, in New York City. And now we're confronted with a huge epidemic. Um, and again, that initial case was just the tip of an iceberg. We are now seeing about 25% of the swabs in tertiary you know, nasal oral swabs being positive for the coronavirus uh, in our community. And if you go out to the suburban areas, it's five to 10%. That's a huge amount of infection. So whatever official numbers we see, it's only showing us the tip of a massive iceberg. And finally, how do you think this ends? And when do you think it ends? both in the United States and maybe around the world? Well, I don't have a firm answer for that question. Here, here are uh, my thoughts. I, I think it's not likely we're going to wipe this out by the summertime as we did for SARS uh, 17 years ago. Uh, this virus has already gained such a strong foothold in the human population including those that reside in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're already seeing a lot of cases in Australia, in Argentina, in South Africa. Uh, so as this weather becomes warmer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's gonna get cooler in the Southern Hemisphere. And the situation might be just like uh, what we face with influenza. It's seasonal and it jumps back and forth between Northern and Southern hemispheres. And, and if that is the case, then uh, it could be that coronavirus would become a fact of life. And uh, we would have to confront this uh, until a solution is del delivered through scientific research. Dr. David Ho, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you, and it's been a pleasure.